Alright, welcome everybody. So today we're going to be talking about international economics. And specifically throughout this mini unit, we're going to be trying to answer the question, is international trade good? This sounds like a really simple question, and economists for a long time thought they had a really obvious answer to it, but uh, the story that is emerging is a little bit more complex than that. Okay, so first just to review some stuff. Uh, opportunity cost, what is it? Hopefully you remember this. It is the value of what you give up. So if you have two options, it is the thing that you don't do. Absolute advantage. Uh, this is something that you don't know yet. Absolute advantage is simply the ability of one nation, or if you're talking about people, let's say, uh, one person, to produce a good more efficiently than another nation or person. So whoever can do something faster, that's has the absolute advantage. Comparative advantage is a little bit more complex. This is the ability of a nation, or again person, to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost than another nation. So this doesn't mean that they produce something necessarily quicker or more efficiently, it just means that they give up less in terms of other options. So their next best option uh, is not uh, they, they would have to give up less in order to produce something. And the law of comparative advantage, which uh, economists have for a few decades at the very least, realized uh, governs international trade, states that nations benefit when they trade in what they have a comparative advantage in, not necessarily an absolute advantage. For centuries before that, they thought that nations only would trade in what they had an absolute advantage in, so therefore nations who did not have absolute advantages in anything would simply not trade with anybody. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, comparative advantage is what really governs whether nations are going to benefit from a trade. So the result of this is that nations specialize in certain things and become interdependent. Uh, so whatever each nation has the lowest opportunity cost in, they will specialize in that. And uh, this allows them to end up with more stuff overall, meaning increase their real GDP and overcome the limits of their opportunity cost. So uh, in the very beginning of this course, we learned about the PPC curve. This shows the frontier or maximum extent of production of any a combination of goods in a two-good economy. So if we're looking at just two goods that nations can choose between, if two nations trade and one nation has a comparative advantage in one good and the other the other good, uh, they can overcome these limits and their, their uh, total GDP then, or I guess the, the total uh, amount of stuff that they have in their economy, can end up out here. So here's an example. Uh, I won't make you do such a complex example ever again, however, uh, it is important to understand how exactly this works. So let's say France can produce 40 tons of cheese or 80 tons of fish in a day, and Japan can produce 50 tons of cheese or 200 tons of fish in a day. So the opportunity cost here for France is 40 tons of cheese to 80 tons of fish, so that means they would have to give up one ton of cheese for every two tons of fish. Japan, however, uh, has an opportunity cost of one ton of cheese per four tons of fish. So this means that France gives up fewer cheeses, or excuse me, fewer fish to produce cheese as compared to Japan. So this is uh, Japan has to give up more fish to produce each bit of cheese. So if they go trade these, they can trade one ton of cheese per three tons of fish. So France is, going, France is going to specialize in cheese and Japan in fish. So let me show you how that all works out here. These are some terribly drawn production possibilities curves. So here is France's cheese to fish curve. So this is supposed to be, what, 40 tons of cheese to 20 tons of fish excuse me, 60 tons of fish, uh, if they produce all 40 tons of cheese and then trade half of that, 20 tons to Japan, meanwhile this is Japan's PPC over here, 
Japan will trade them back with 60 tons of fish. And this means that France ends up with 20 tons of cheese, because they traded the other 20 to Japan, and 60 tons of fish, which they got from Japan. That falls outside of their PPC curve. Japan, on the other hand, will end up with 140 tons of fish, uh, because they gave 60 of it to France, and 20 tons of cheese, which again is outside of their PPC curve. So, this is how it works in theory, basically. That each nation will specialize in what they have the lowest opportunity cost in, and then any workers who, let's say in the previous example, fishermen in France, would move on to other industries. They would quickly and costlessly move on. However, in reality, and this is something that uh, economists have come to discover only really in recent decades, is that while GDP can certainly be increased by international trade and everyone gets cheaper goods, the allocation of workers, meaning workers moving to other industries, can actually be pretty tough. So economists are still uncovering some evidence about this. So this takes us back to our original question, is international trade good? And uh, throughout this mini unit we'll be uncovering some more examples of this, uh, but this is kind of our first taste of the economic theory and then how that might compare to reality.